Hi learners, welcome back to CA Foundation Principles and Practice of Accounting Marathon Revision. We are in part 5 or lecture 5 of our CA Foundation Revision. In the past, we have revised till chapter 6 and in this video, we will start with chapter 7, Final Accounts of Sole Proprietors. So, let's get started and before I go any further ahead, a small announcement that I have been making to all of you people in the past 3-4 videos as well. You guys have an amazing free mega revision test series coming up from 15th of June. 15th of June at 2 p.m. will be accounts and followed by 18th, 21st and 23rd for law, maths and economics. It's going to be 30 minutes, 20 MCQs, which you guys can attempt for free and then test your examination preparations. What are you waiting for? Download an academy application today. Take up this free test revision series to test your exam preparation. Also coming up on June 12th, ECA Intermediate Mega Combat. This will give you huge discount on your CA Intermediate subscription which is definitely the need of the hour post your CA foundation examination. Again, this can be taken up for 60 minutes for, and it will be of 40 MCQs and it's at 12 p.m. on June 12th. Enroll today and use the code YESHES which is Y-E-S-H-A-S -S, to unlock this mega combat. You know the iconic program which is a flagship model of uh, CA uh, course under Unacademy. So this gives great benefits of one-to-one -one mentoring, one-to-one -one live doubt solving and evaluated test series will be conducted within the feedback will also be given as to how do you improve your exam preparations you get the printed copy of the material at your doorstep and you get to be part of not discussion channel for all your doubts and you also get to attend sessions taken by industrial experts so what are you waiting for take up an academy iconic subscription which is over and above the normal plus subscription of uh, live classes recorded backup being available one subscription giving access to all the educators notes and regular doubt solving sessions so that's the point and uh, talking about the subscription the subscription cost for 24 months is 41,000 for 12 months it's 28,600 and 6 months subscription cost 20,500 and you can use the code YESHES LIVE to get 10% off on the prices that you see here on the screen and that's it guys hoping to see you all on the Unacademy platform very soon wherein we take up our classes in the full stream mainstream way comprehensively in English or CA Foundation, CA Intermediate and beyond. Fantastic. So without wasting much time, come let's get started with our topic of financial statements or final accounts of sole proprietors. So from this chapter, you will get questions on manufacturing concern as well as non-manufacturing concern. So talking about final accounts, entire final accounts can be classified into two major classifications. One, to evaluate financial performance. Other one, to evaluate financial position. To evaluate performance, we prepare manufacturing, trading, P&L, P&L appropriation. To evaluate financial position, we can prepare balance sheet and cash flow statement. Now, manufacturing account. Now, talking about manufacturing account, trading account. Is it manufacturing account or trading account? Or is it manufacturing account and trading account? That's a question to which lot of students answer wrong in spite of attending regular classes to the extent possible. You get this? So, let us answer this question this way. So, with regard to an entity, you need to check if the entity is it trading, is it buying and selling the goods or is it manufacturing and selling the goods. So, a manufacturing entity will buy raw material, convert it to finished goods and sell finished goods. A trading entity will buy finished goods and then sell finished goods. One common point here is selling. Both the entities will sell finished goods. Both the entities will buy but manufacturing entity will buy raw material trading entity will buy finished goods all by itself so if an entity is a manufacturing entity it will prepare manufacturing account and a trading account if it is only trading entity and a non manufacturing entity it will still prepare trading account so trading account is not an option trading account is must if you are a manufacturing entity you additionally prepare manufacturing account also that's the point now, with regard to inventory, we have three variants, raw material, work in progress and finished goods. Raw material will appear in manufacturing account. Work in progress will also appear in manufacturing account. Finished goods will be transferred from manufacturing account to trading account. So, in the manufacturing account, we will write opening WIP, closing WIP, debit credit. Raw material will be not be written opening purchase, opening and then closing on debit and credit side. We identify the consumption of raw material in conversion of work in progress to finished goods. That is identified by taking opening raw material, add purchase of raw material, less closing raw material. That will give us consumption. To this, we add up our manufacturing expenses to arrive at what exactly is the cost of production of finished goods, which will be transferred from manufacturing account to trading. And in the trading accounts, my friend, on the debit side, 
after opening stock we usually write purchases if it is a manufacturing entity in place of two purchases we'll be writing two manufacturing account so let me help you all understand the format of manufacturing account manufacturing account is prepared at the factory so if in case you open the doors of the factory what you find at the factory is opening work in progress closing work in progress and during the year certain raw material is purchase opening value is there purchase and closing will write that will give us the consumption of raw material during the year to this if we add the expenses incurred for converting raw material to finished goods we will understand what is the value of finished goods transferred to trading account this is found as balance sheet there is not going to be any profit on manufacturing closes manufacturing account is prepared with the objective of identifying the value of goods transferred from manufacturing to trading that is the cost of production that is the objective of manufacturing account there is no profit in manufacturing profit is at the time of sale so if there is any sale of scrap it's simultaneously returned in manufacturing account then we'll go down to trading account in the trading account we'll write opening finished goods on the debit side closing finished goods on the credit if there is finished goods purchase because it is not a manufacturing entity and a trading entity we'll write two purchases less returns if it is a manufacturing entity they would not purchase finished goods but finished goods will come from manufacturing account to this you will write any other wages incurred in the process of trading and will write the sales amount less of returns once you do this you will arrive at gross profit as balance in figure in our trading account got it once the trading account is done this gp is transferred to pnl account so we will write it in our pnl account uh, i'll just show it to you give me a moment so we'll go down to pnl account next and pnl account we will write gp we'll write our indirect incomes if any write our gross loss if it's on the debit and indirect expense to find net profit and this is the balance in figure which will go to pnl appropriation from there to balance sheet however at ca foundation level you don't have any questions on appropriation so balance will be straight away added to the capital in balance sheet <clears throat> got it guys fantastic now let's quickly understand quite a lot of other topics <coughs> in the preparation of trading account now information for trading account will come from trial balance so trial balance will have opening stock trial balance will have purchases sales as well as direct expense so on the debit side you'll have opening stock purchases on the credit side you'll have sales and uh, direct expense will again be on the debit side closing stock will always be available in adjustment you guys get this we learned no chapter 4 in the second video i taught it to you i told you closing stock is not a transaction but it's an event resulting in the resulting from transactions we compute closing stock outside the books of accounts we compute it we bring it into books of accounts this needs to be entered into double entry system meaning we will write it in the trading account credit side as well as in the balance sheet asset side you would have to do both so that is the reason it will be available in adjustment see it will be written in trading account credit side as well as balance sheet asset side however if closing stock is a why is closing stock appearing in uh, adjustments i just answered that to you can we include closing stock in trial balance yes if closing stock appears in trial balance it should appear both debit and credit because it's an off balance sheet item if it comes on both sides debit and credit debit aspect will go to balance sheet asset side credit aspect will go to trading account credit side however the credit aspect of closing stock in the trial balance can be put along with opening stock and purchases to arrive at adjusted purchases or cost of goods sold we all know this right opening stock plus purchase minus closing stock is cost of goods sold opening stock debit balance purchase debit balance and the credit side of the trial balance may closing stock part can be adjusted together to arrive at cost of goods sold or adjusted purchases if cost of goods sold or adjusted purchases is there in the trial balance instead of opening stock and purchases in such a case closing stock will not be appearing in the credit side in trial balance it will be appearing only on the debit why the credit aspect of closing stock is already adjusted with purchases and opening stock to arrive at cox what do we do in such case the debit balance of trial balance may whatever is there no closing stock that will be straight away taken to balance sheet so that's the important point that i was trying to convey here on this the questions do come in the exam i hope you will remember this next thing is discount with regard to discount in the questions there can be two sorts of discount trade discount cash discount trade discount is a discount given at the time of bargaining purchase sale this will be adjusted against the price and will arrive at the net figure however cash discount is a discount that is given at the time of settlement in cash not at the time of trade you bought the goods today or you sold the goods today this needs to be settled in cash at a later date no on that later date when it is settled in cash that's when we give discount or receive discount that my friends is cash discount 
for cash discount we are always going to write accounting entry is going to be accounting entry for this is going to be accounting entry for this cash discount however there is going to be no accounting entry for trade discount it will be adjusted it will be adjusted against the price i hope you guys got this part did you yeah okay then the next part stock lot of times stocks can be issued otherwise than by way of sale what are the times where the stock can be issued otherwise by way on sale one for private use whenever the proprietor withdraws the stock for private use it is to be considered as drawings and the journal entry for the same will be drawings account debit to purchase account it will be deducted from the capital and deducted from purchases yeah and whenever the goods are given away as charity such charity or donation is not business expense it is again personal expense and it has to be again debited to drawings and credited to purchase account so whether goods are used for private purpose or given away as charity entry will be drawings to purchase only if the goods are given as advertisement or free sample advertisement expenditure will be debited and credit will be given to purchases when the goods are destroyed by fire you would have to write pnl account debit to purchases if it is not insured if it is insured you will write insurance company account debit to purchase because insurance company will reimburse that expense due if it is partly insured and partly not to the extent insured you write insurance company debit to the extent not insured it will come in pnl account debit as loss ultimately it will decrease our purchases what i want you all to remember very importantly is whenever goods are issued other than by way of sale we cannot write sales account credit we have to decrease it from purchases because all of these transactions whatever i mentioned right now to you these have to be adjusted at cost price because there is not going to be any profit yeah there is not going to be any profit all adjusted at what price cost price adjusted at cost price ah uh, it's not written at selling price so we will write these entries as deduction from purchases and not addition to sales you got this because see i withdraw goods will i make profit from the same no i will withdraw them at cost got it and even when the goods are given to employees you would again write salary account debit or employee advance account debit to purchase it has to be deducted from purchases it cannot be written as an addition to sales i hope you all got this and will remember this in the problem we cannot do final accounts big lengthy problem in marathon revision but i'll revise all the concepts which is very much required in solving the big problems on the topic of final accounts got it guys i hope you did get chalo let's get going next one distinction between direct and indirect expenditure so if the expense is directly related to manufacturing it will come in manufacturing account if the expense is relating to trading of goods it will come in trading if not if it is indirect it will come in uh, pnl account for example wages paid for manufacturing manufacturing wages manufacturing account wages at the wages at the warehouse trading account salaries paid to employees pnl account lighting and heating expenditure manufacturing account warehouse lighting uh, expenditure electricity expenditure trading account office lighting expenditure pnl account rent of the factory manufacturing rent of the warehouse trading rent of the office pnl account so depending upon the place where such expenditure is incurred we can segregate them into manufacturing trading and pnl yeah if you write a manufacturing expense in trading account the answer would go little wrong so remember that and then stay little cautious with that and pnl account i have already explained it to you certain expenses and uh, income items will understand this part that deferred revenue part along with accrual part expense or income need to appear in pnl account i told this to you here in pnl account credit side we write indirect income and pnl account debit side we write indirect expense this expense needs to be written on accrual basis entire current year expense should come in pnl debit entire current year income should come in pnl credit irrespective of the fact whether it is paid or not irrespective of the fact whether it is received or not yeah if expense is 10000 paid is 10000 fantastic no problem if you pay more if you pay more than the current year expense that is called prepaid expense what is it if the expense paid is more than the current year expense or we can say money paid but benefit is not taken that is prepaid expense however this will not be part of our current year expense it is next year's expense paid now so in the current year it will not come in pnl account it will be recorded in balance sheet as an asset 
entry will not be expense to cash instead the entry will be prepaid expense to cash if it is expense to cash it will go to pnl debit if it is prepaid expense to cash such prepaid expense will go to balance sheet as asset done next part we need to write outstanding expenses as a liability what is outstanding expense expense is incurred amount is not paid so benefit is taken money is not paid when the benefit is taken but the money is not paid benefit is taken it is current year expense it will come in pnl account debit it is outstanding no so outstanding expense will be credited outstanding expense is liability it will come in balance sheet as liability if it was paid it would have reduced our cash because you have not paid it will come in balance sheet as liability i hope you guys got this let's go to the next part we have incomes coming up next yeah incomes pre received income meaning if income is earned income is received no problem what is received is what is earned no problem it will come in pnl account and cash account debit if you have received some money and you have not earned it you have received some money but you have not earned it next year's income received this year that's what we call as pre received income what is it money received but we have not given the benefit yet we have not earned it yet such amount is liability cash will be debited and pre received income will be credited and it's written as liability in the balance sheet next up we have accrued income meaning income is earned but not received benefit is given income is earned but money is not received so in this case because you have earned the income you will credit your income it will come in pnl account credit side it cannot be written in cash account debit instead you will write in balance sheet as accrued income got it guys so this with regard to expense and income same concept will be revisited by us in the chapter of npo please do remember yeah fantastic so remember current year expense current year income will be written in pnl account whether paid or not whether received or not if it is received in extra income it will be liability if it is not received income which is earned it is asset with regard to expense if it is paid more than what we have incurred it will become asset if you have not paid though we have taken the benefit it will become liability so you need to remember what is outstanding expense prepaid expense what is uh, accrued income and pre received income once you get this lot of other items with regard to your chapter of final accounts will get sorted yeah then uh, that's what i was telling this topic is to be read in npo chapter also yeah got that so then we have remuneration this questions usually come in the chapter of uh, partnership also usually they ask more there and less here however we will cover it in both places managerial remuneration yeah it can be given as a fixed amount they can say 1 lakh rupees per annum 10000 rupees per month 50000 per annum they can tell that or they can keep it as a variable amount on profit manager can be given commission as a percentage of profit which will result in higher remuneration in the case of higher profits lower remuneration in the case of lower profits is that possible absolutely yes that is possible yeah in such a case what do we do we can compute it either on before charging basis or on after charging basis so how do we get to know whether it is before charging or after charging this will be mentioned to us in the question the question will tell whether to compute managerial remuneration on before charging basis or to compute remuneration on after charging basis if they say before do if it is x percent you do x by 100 simple if they say after you do x by 100 plus x you should do x divided by 100 plus x so this is the tricky part and this is what you need to remember you guys get this so if they say 10% of profit as remuneration before charging basis or before charging such commission you will do profit into 10 by 100 if they say profit remuneration is to be given at 10% after charging such commission then you will do profit multiplied by 10 divided by 110 meaning after paying such remuneration or commission to manager whatever remains that profit may 10% should be the remuneration what was given so before remuneration given whatever was was there was like 110 out of the 10 is given and 100 is remaining isn't it so that's the logic yeah i can teach this in a little lengthier format spending some 30 minutes in fact i've done a youtube session on this very thing you just search for trick problems on managerial remuneration on uh, youtube you will find with my name cr ajwardhan you will find lectures on this we have done uh, good one two hours of uh, revision exclusively on this problem so you can understand that uh, if you want detailed understanding we can do that if not remember before x by 100 after x by 100 plus x that's it that's how we compute managerial remuneration done so then uh, adjustments can come with regard to sunday data
with regard to sundry debtors remember sundry debtors is an asset it will appear in the trial balance on the debit side you would have to take it to the balance sheet asset side katham bad debts is an expense and it will reduce debtors journal entry for bad debts is bad debts account debit to debtors account bad debts is an expense debit it will reduce our debtors credit debtors the entry is bad debts account debit to debtors account then this bad debts needs to be posted to pnl account so we will write the entry pnl account debit to bad debts that is transfer of bad debts to pnl and provision provision is a liability when you create it it is an expense so entry for provision is pnl account debit to provision account pnl account debit to provision account this is the entry so remember debtors is an asset trial balance debit side so you will get it you will put it to balance sheet assets bad debts is an expense and it will reduce debtors entry for bad debts is bad debts to debtors bad debts account debit because it's expense debtors account credit because it is decrease in the asset and provision is a liability but when you create it it is an expense so journal entry for provision is pnl account debit to provision pnl account debit because it is expense provision credit because it acts like a liability these are the entries now let's go into our concept of additional bad debts additional provision and all of this yeah try and understand bad debts ke liye you need to pass two entries bad debts to debtors pnl to bad debts if in case bad debts is given in trial balance if in case bad debts is given in trial balance then it means that this entry bad debts to debtors is already passed it's already passed we don't have to pass this entry you will only deduct it from debtors in uh, sorry it's already deducted from debtors we will only post it to balance pnl account debit side only the posting entry is to be done if bad debts is appearing in adjustments then this entry of bad debts to debtors also should be passed pnl to bad debts entry also should be passed meaning we need to deduct bad debts from debtors as well as write it in pnl account debit side you got this let me repeat the bad debts adjustment if bad debts appears in trial balance it means that bad debts to debtors entry is already passed we don't have to pass that entry anymore we don't have to deduct bad debts from debtors anymore only thing that we need to do is we need to write this bad debts in pnl account debit side as expense because the second entry is not done however if bad debts appear in adjustment it means that bad debts to debtors entry is also not passed transfer to pnl entry is also not made so what should we do we should write the entry bad debts to debtors and reduce it from debtors in balance sheet also post bad debts to pnl account debit side as an expense you need to do both <clears throat> i hope you guys understood this part next let's go to provision provision there would be some provision already there in the trial balance what do we do we don't have to write this entry this entry is already passed that is the reason provision is appearing in trial balance credit side what do we do with provision it's a liability should be written in balance sheet liability side however as a matter of presentation they belong to the same family of debtors so instead of writing in balance sheet liability side we'll deduct it from the debtors and write it in the balance sheet asset side let me repeat provision is a liability it needs to be written in the balance sheet liability side however as a matter of presentation instead of writing in the balance sheet liability side we will deduct it from the debtors in the balance sheet inner column is there an entry for such deduction provision to debtors or something no 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 it's only presentation part sir this is okay sir what about additional provision what they give in adjustment that's the interesting part whenever they give provision in the adjustments then what to do pretty simple adjustment may whatever comes is the total provision correct provision amount so check what is the existing provision assume that trial balance may provision is 1000 adjustment may provision is 1500 so provision is already there for 1000 rupees adjustment says provision needs to be maintained at 1500 so 1000 is there 1500 should be there so what does it mean provision needs to be increased by 500 so what should you do for 500 rupees you need to write the entry pnl to provision 500 rupees additional provision created pnl account expense to the existing 1000 provision we add 500 new provision created total provision becomes 1500 but in your class 12 or second pc you don't do that you write off entire old provision create entire new provision a provision is provision at the end of the day 1000 provision is already there 1500 is the provision to be maintained create only 500 provision no over 
why do you have to write off that thousand provision and newly create thousand five hundred provision? You don't literally do that, but you do that minus thousand plus thousand five hundred. You do all that in PNL. Don't have to do. Do only five hundred rupees additional provision. Alternatively, if in case provision is thousand and the question says provision is to be maintained at nine hundred, hundred rupees provision is to be written off because already you have thousand no trial balance. But adjustment says provision is to be maintained at nine hundred. 100 needs to be written off. So, what do we do for 100? Ulta. Instead of writing PNL debit to provision, we will write provision debit to PL. And this will appear in PNL account credit side as income because provision is no longer required and it is written off. Understood? I hope you guys did understand with regard to Sunday debtors, bad debts, and provision. Yeah, I will soon come out with another detailed video on how to deal with debtors, provision, and Sunday debtors, like the entire family card adjustment. That will be a detailed 2 3 hour video with a lot of small, 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 small questions. In fact, it is there in the Excel sheet that I was using as well. It is there in here. You guys can access it. I can share it with you people. If you guys text it to me, I can share the link to this Excel sheet. Here we've done a lot of kuti 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 questions to understand this in detail. Let me show. Point is the entire final account, entire revision is going to be. Uh, let's say a short one if i do some 35 40 hours revision it will not be called marathon you guys would not watch it also it will be like what 30 hours revision revision has to be quick revision has to be crisp that is the reason i'm skipping that if not i would show it to you in detail guys See, this is that commission managerial remuneration computation detailed with explanation yeah example number one example number two why is it like this? Try this and other alternate logic. Everything we've done. Yeah. Bad debts I'm not able to find. If in case I find it, I can show it to you. We've done a lot of small, 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 small questions to understand how to deal with bad debts. And then we did one big problem to understand the same. Ah, see here. Sunday debtors and family. We have it in detail. Sunday debtors is an asset. Bad debts is an expense. Provision is a liability. Small, small problems. Yeah. We did small, small. Kutti, see example one. Kutti kutti problem. Yeah. Trial balance, debtors is 1 lakh, bad debts is 10,000, how do you adjust? Then there is additional bad debts of 2,000, how do we adjust? Total bad debts is 12,000, how do we adjust? Then we'll bring in provision to be maintained at 10,000, provision to be maintained at 10%, provision to be maintained at 7,000, which needs rating off of some amount of provision. There is additional bad debts and provision. There is additional bad debts and provision at percentage. So all of this, for each of the case, we've done PNL extract and balance sheet extract. I can share this sheet with you. It is self-explanatory. You see this and gradually case by case the difficulty level goes on increasing. Yeah. If in case I start explaining this in detail, my entire uh, how to say marathon revision, which I planned for 5, which is now going down to become somewhere around 6-7 uh, hours, will end up becoming 10 hours. So, that will become too much and that will create disinterest in you to watch. So, if you guys want it, please do ping me. I will share this Excel sheet with you. You can see those small, small uh, capsule problems to understand the bad debts and provision topic a little better. You guys got this? So, chalo. let's get going to the next part. Ah, here I am. <clears throat> so, Sunday data is part done. Then we'll go to balance sheet. So, balance sheet may we'll write fixed assets and current assets on the asset side, capital, non current liabilities, and current liabilities at the bottom. So, the capital will take the opening capital of the previous year. To this, we add the current year profit, deduct the drawings, also uh, adjust for interest on capital and interest on drawings. And that's how we finally arrive at capital. So, I've tried to cover the entire final accounts of uh, sole proprietorship with regard to adjustments in detail here. I hope this was helpful. And uh, one small theory question that you need to remember is what is the order of writing the entries in the balance sheet? So, it's called as reversed liquidity order. Or uh, it's what you say, it's called as uh, it's called as a reverse liquidity order. That's the order of items in the balance sheet. It's like order of permanence. Permanent items on the top and then non-permanent items at the bottom. Non-current, uh, fixed items at the top, current items at the bottom. So this is called marshalling. Marshalling is the order of items in the balance sheet. Remember the name? What is it? Reversed liquidity order or order of permanence. That's what we follow. Reverse liquidity order or also called as permanence this is the name 
there can be a two ma i would say an mcq question usually that used to come in cpt level uh, on this point but now the cpt questions are no mcq questions are not there it's all about uh, two marker four marker six markers and all but still good to remember good to know yeah know this fact and uh, that's it my friends we are done with the chapter 7 that is final accounts let's now get into chapter 8 which deals with partnership account shall we start with partnership chapter 8 so maybe in this if i can finish partnership in the next one i can take up uh, company accounts and npo let's see if we can fit into this fifth one or we can do a sixth separate video <coughs> chalo let's start with partnership accountings that is chapter 8 of your ca foundation syllabus hmm. <coughs> what do you mean by partnership partnership the definition is there Uh, i'll see if i have covered it up in the excel sheet up here yes we have it is an association of uh, two or more partners coming together for the purpose of business to share the profits and losses arising thereon where activities are carried on by all or any one of the acting from you got it so this is the definition of partnership and then number of partners in partnership is according to section 464 of companies act 2013 maximum number of partners is 100 However, as per company rules, maximum number of partners is fifty. So, what do we follow? We need to follow both. So, a company cannot have more than fifty people. <coughs> Sorry, a partnership cannot have more than fifty people. If it has more than fifty people, it becomes illegal association unless it gets itself registered as a company. So, Companies Act will tell how many people can be there in partnership. How does it say? It says any number, any organization, not just partnership, any form of organization which has more than fifty or more than hundred. either rule says 50 act says 100 if it has more than such number of people and if it doesn't register itself as company then it will be illegal association you get that so a partnership firm will become illegal if it has more than 50 people so maximum limit is 50 in that case you get this and uh, there is a provision that allows partner in the case of profits only yeah there can be uh, people who take care only profits and they'll not take losses if there is profit i'll share loss i'll not share can be and uh, there is a possibility to have an inactive or dormant partner also to the firm are the terms partner partnership and partnership firm same no they are different partner is the individual partnership is the relationship between these two individuals partnership firm is the name under which these partners perform their business got it there is no mutuality partners represent the firm so if partnership is liable partners are liable you cannot say partnership and partners are two distinct persons eh no 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 there is no separate legal entity partners itself represent the partnership form separate legal entity is there only in the case of company yeah it's a body corporate got it then partnership firm is constituted based on agreement called as deed agreement of partnership is nothing but deed it is called as partnership deed partnership deed can be oral or can be written or it can not be there also however if the partnership deed is not there then the partnership form cannot get registered if the partnership form doesn't get registered then what happens yeah outsiders can sue the firm but the partnership firm cannot sue outsiders other than for an amount lesser than 100 if it is more than 100 they can't sue sir 100 really partnership act is made in 1932 back in those days 100 was a good amount so they had kept like okay if you are a small business you don't have to register you can still file cases for 100 rupees but if you are filing case for more than 100 it means that you are a big firm you should get registered that was the logic now though it doesn't make logic at all <clears throat> yeah so if your partnership firm is not registered outsiders can sue you but you can't sue outsiders yeah remember that let's go to the next part so what are the contents of partnership deed if in case you make partnership deed it can be oral or written if it is written partnership deed it will have the names of the name of the partnership firm address of the partnership firm name of the partners address of the partners capital contributed by them profit sharing ratio what is the interest on capital that can be given to them what is the interest on drawings what is the salary that should be given to any of the partners if they are eligible what is the role and responsibility of each of the partners and um, what do you say then uh, how to deal in the case of death of a partner when will the partnership firm uh, till when will it exist in the case of dissolution how to do who gets what all these terms no should be good will how to compute yeah everything will be discussed in the partnership deed if the partnership deed is oral or if the partnership deed is not there then the savior is section 13 of partnership act 1932 you need to follow section 13 of partnership act 1932 whenever there is no 
पार्टनरशिप डीड वट एज सेक्शन थर्टीन से सेक्शन थर्टीन एज फाइव क्लॉजेस ए बी सी डी ई दिस फाइव क्लॉजेस विल टेल हाउ टू डील इन द केस ऑफ एब्सेंस ऑफ पार्टनरशिप डीड और ओवरऑल पार्टनरशिप डीड और पार्टनरशिप डीड इज देर बट इट डजेंट टॉक एनीथिंग अबाउट दिस पॉइंट देन यूड हैव टू फॉलो दिस नंबर वन इट सेज प्रॉफिट एंड लॉसेस आर टू बी शेयर इक्वल वेन एवर देर इज नो पार्टनरशिप डीड और पार्टनरशिप डीड इज साइलेंट प्रॉफिट एंड लॉसेस शुड बी शेयर इक्वली बिटवीन ऑल द पार्टनर्स एंड द सेकेंड पॉइंट इज देर इज नो सैलरी नो कमीशन नो रेम्यूनरेशन टू एनी ऑफ द पार्टनर्स एंड ऑल द पार्टनर्स विल हैव इक्वल राइट इक्वल रेस्पॉन्सिबिलिटीज इट के नॉट से आई एम रेस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर दिस यू आर नॉट रेस्पॉन्सिबल फॉर दिस यू आई हैव द राइट ऑन दिस नो ऑल द पार्टनर्स हैव इक्वल राइट इक्वल रेस्पॉन्सिबिलिटीज इक्वल रोल इन द बिजनेस इक्वल शेयर इन द प्रॉफिट and no partner will get any salary or remuneration whether they are active whether they are passive whether they are whatever it is done no interest on capital no interest on drawings if partner has contributed any advance to the firm over and above his capital then he can claim interest at 6% simple interest that's it he can't claim 7 he can't claim 5 you get this so this is the model deed which is given under section 13 of partnership act 1932 I hope you all understood this. <clears throat> Next part is P and L account and P and L appropriation account. We just touched this upon in uh, previous chapter, that is uh, P and L account chapter. But this will come in detail in the partnership chapter. P and L account, P and L account is prepared to identify the profit. P and L appropriation account is prepared to distribute the profit. So activities between the organization and outsiders. So employee salary, rent to landlord. depreciation and all other transportation carriage all other expenses will come in pnl account but if there is any transactions between the firm and the partners like interest on capital interest on drawings salary or remuneration to partners share of profit given to partners all of this this will come in pnl appropriation account because this is appropriation of income not charge against income got it interest on capital paid to partners is not expense it will not decrease your profit because there is profit you are paying interest on capital <clears throat> because partner is not an outsider you get this so appropriation of profits is computed and written in pnl appropriation account this will have transaction between partner and the firm so any payment to the partner or receipt from the partner will come in pnl appropriation account other than interest on uh, loan given by partner to firm that is like an outsider is given loan so like an outsider firm will pay interest that will come in pnl account only other than interest on loan given by partner to firm other than that for rest all the transactions between partner and the firm like interest on capital interest on drawing salary or remuneration share of profit everything will come in pnl appropriation account <coughs> so we do pnl we identify the profit we bring down that net profit from that net profit we pay remuneration to partners we pay interest on capital to partners we pay interest on advance oh sorry this is also have given here yeah this also okay fine in certain cases this also will be written here and then what do we do then uh, we write uh, actually this should not come here yeah so we will write the profit here we will write uh, remuneration to partners and interest on capital here and then the share of profit will be written on the uh, if there is any will be distributed here if it is loss it's written here you get this so that's the point and then capital accounts of the partners has to be learned how to prepare it next so capital accounts can be prepared under two methods fixed capital system fluctuating capital system under fixed capital system we prepare only one uh, sorry under fluctuating capital system we prepare only one account capital account in that capital account only we will write capital interest drawings interest on capital interest on drawings remuneration share of profit everything so capital keeps on fluctuating capital is not constant and this will make it actually difficult for us to compute interest on capital however if you want to keep the capital fixed and write all these transactions in a separate ledger what do we do we write the fixed capital as per the partnership deed in the capital account we open one more current account in this current account we write interest on capital interest on drawings drawings remuneration share of profit all this will write in here that is fixed capital system where the capital is fixed so this is the format of fluctuating capital system a partners capital account and uh, this is the format of fixed capital system a partners capital account and partners <coughs> sorry current account <coughs> been taking class for so long no continuously throat has gone bad <coughs> sorry guys you had to hear all that 
done by this we are done with our capital accounts remuneration to partners as i mentioned to you previously remuneration can be given either on before charging basis or after charging basis whenever it is given as a percentage of profit if they give it on before charging basis what do we do we write it as profit multiplied by x by 100 however if it is given on after charging basis then we write <coughs> sorry profit multiplied by x divided by 100 plus x we add x to the denominator same what we discussed in chapter 7 done uh, kuti kuti example problems are also there on that then interest on capital interest on capital is to be provided on the capital account balance only and not on the current account balance and it is to be provided only if there is mention in the partnership deed if there is no mention in the partnership deed then there will be no interest on capital then interest on drawings again it needs to be computed only if there is mention in the partnership deed if not no if there is one drawing you compute on that drawing from the date of drawing till the year end however if there are multiple drawings you need to do multiple times interest computation you can use this shortcut if the same amount is withdrawn at the beginning of every month then you can compute it for an average period of 6.5 months if the same amount is withdrawn at the middle of every month then you can compute interest for an average period of 6 months if the same amount is withdrawn at the end of every month then compute it for an average period of 5.5 months similarly if it is at the beginning of every quarter 7.5 months if at the middle of every quarter then 6 months if it is at the end of every quarter then at 4.5 months if it is made at the beginning of every half year then 9 in the middle of every half year 6 if it at the end of every half year 3 months or if the drawing is made but they have not told us the drawing then you do it for an average period of 6 months if in case the drawing is made on different dates and the amounts are different then we can go by product method which is similar to our concept of average to date me what we did yeah you can apply that <coughs> and then compute the interest on drawings I have solved an example problem on all of this. Uh, this and all you know how to do. You will take 1000 is withdrawn at the beginning of every month. So you do 1000 into 12 into 6.5 by 12 into 10 percent. That is rate of interest. Yeah. If it is made at the middle of every month, then you do 1000 into 12 total drawings into 6 by 12 into 10 percent. And then 6 months, 7.5, 6, 4.5, 3.5, all that. If it is product method, you do this way. You write the date of drawing. You write the amount of drawing. You identify the period in months from the date of drawing till the year end. For this period, this drawing is made. You multiply these two to arrive at product. You take the total product, divide it by, if this is months, you will do 1 by 12. If this was days, you would have done 1 by 365. Multiply by 10%. This is just a shortcut. If not, you are supposed to do 3000 into 11 by 12 into 10%, 2500 into 7.5 by 12 into 10%. You are supposed to do individually. So the common part is this into this, no? On the total, you can do divide by 1 by 2 into 1 by 12 into 10 percent. That is common for all the drawings. So, that is a shortcut that we do here. Understood? Then comes the share of profit. Whenever the profits are to be shared, the profit is computed after paying interest on capital, salary, commission, interest on advance, if any, or any other payments to partner. Only making all of these, that's when we compute our share of profit, which needs to be uh, shared between the partners. And uh, there can be a special clause in the partnership deed which will guarantee a certain amount to any one of the partners. That is a guarantee given by few partners to one partner who has been joined because he brings in lot of value to the firm. So people who are guaranteeing minimum money to the other partner are called guaranteeing partners. The partner who is taking the privilege of minimum guarantee is called as guaranteed partner. So if we guaranteed certain amount of money, what we do is First, we divide the profit among all the partners in the profit sharing ratio. Then we check if the guaranteed partner has received the money that is guaranteed. If he has received minimum money, then good. If he is not, the balance money needs to be pulled in from the guaranteeing partners in the ratio that was pre-agreed to compensate to the guaranteed partner. You get this? So here I have solved a lot of examples wherein see uh, Virat, AB and Nax are partners. Yeah. Virat, AB and Nax for equal share, one third, one third. And Nax has been minimum guarantee of 1 lakh has been given. So if the profit is 3 lakh, all of them get 1, 1, 1. So there is no problem. His minimum guarantee is 1 lakh. However, if we go to a case where profits is 4 lakh 50, again, no problem. Let's go to a case where profit is uh, only case 3. Profit is only 1 lakh 80. The profit is 1 lakh 80. Everyone will get 60, 60, 60. Mr. Nax was promised 1 lakh, but he's got only 60,000. So what will he do? He will ask for additional 40. 
that 40 will come from AB and Virat. Both of them have to contribute equally, 20-20. So their share will reduce from 60 to 40. AB also will reduce his share from 60 to 40. 2020, they will pull in to give to Nax to give him 40,000 and to retain him in the business. So this year, they are sharing it in the equal ratio. Guarantee is given by Virat and AB in equal, 1 is to 1 ratio. But it can be in a ratio other than 1 is to 1. Or it can be a case where only Virat is guaranteeing, AB is not guaranteeing. And NAX will remain guaranteed partner. All that is possible. At the merit of the problem, this adjustment has to be picked, identified, understood and solved. So, you guys can understand that part. And then the next part is distribution profits in the case of insufficiency. In a case where there is no sufficient profits and the profit is insufficient to either pay interest on capital also. Then what do we do? Then the profits remaining will be first used to pay the interest on capital in the proportion of payable and uh, there is no share of profits for example there are two partners capitals are 1 lakh and 60000 profit sharing ratio is equal in that case if the profit available is not sufficient to even pay interest on capital such profit will not be shared in profit sharing ratio it will be shared in capital ratio by this i mean to say that insufficient money will be used to pay proportionate amount of interest on capital so it will be in capital ratio and it will not be in profit sharing Got it? See here, if the profits are not sufficient to pay interest on capital in full, then such insufficient profits will be shared among partners in capital ratio and not in profit sharing ratio. See, logic, interest on capital payable, interest on capital payable is greater than net profit available. So, we don't share profits without paying interest on capital. So, we pay proportionate interest on capital available from net profit. This is same as distributing profit in capital ratio. Got it? So, we used to do a lot of small, small problems on this to make people understand the concept and a lot of other things. So, I hope you all are now clear with the introduction of partnership part. So, if you are clear with the introduction of partnership, let me now take you all to the goodwill part and then we will do admission, retirement and death. Yeah, I hope it's all going good and fantastic. The recording is great. Chalo, let's now go to goodwill. So, what is goodwill? First and foremost thing is it is not good space will. It is not good space will. It is goodwill. It's one single word. Remember from that. It is nothing but the reputation, future profit earning capacity or an intangible asset, name and fame or the super profit earning capacity of the firm. Yeah, but I will define goodwill this way. Goodwill is the probability that the existing customers will stick to same business. If I am running a business, some customer walked into my store yesterday. What is the probability that the same customer will walk into my store even today and then buy the goods today? The probability of he walking in again today and then doing business with me is my goodwill. Got it guys? Fantastic. Chalo, let's start. Goodwill is accounting policy. There are multiple methods to compute goodwill. Average profit method, super profit method, capitalization method and annuity method. Average profit method, there are two sub methods called as simple average profit and weighted average profit. Let us see how is this working. Yeah. And in here, goodwill is computed as adjusted average profit multiplied by number of years purchase. Meaning, whatever is the profit that can be maintained in the future, that is adjusted average profit. Average of the profits less non-recurring and exceptional items. And I told you, it is the probability that existing customer will stick to my same business. If in case I say, my old customer will stick to my same business for next 3 years. So, profit that I will make for next 3 years is my goodwill. It's my asset. Got it? So, average profit that I will make for the future multiplied by number of years for which the customer will come and do business with me that is my goodwill under average profit method that is the reason we do here into number of years purchase i don't think uh, many of us usually understand what exactly is number of years purchase formula says number of years purchase we do number of years purchase but we need to pay weightage to the for how to say the definition of goodwill here which says goodwill is probability that the existing customers will stick to same business so this definition what i mentioned now will substantiate the reason why we multiply by number of years purchase. Guys liked it? Maza aya? So, aise maar do na. Aise maar do na thoda. Yeah, if you guys do like it, please do hit the desk once. Yeah, a small gesture of happiness. Okay. Then how to find adjusted average profit? It is nothing but future maintainable profit. From the profit, we eliminate all the abnormal incomes and abnormal expenses like insurance claim, lottery profit, profit on sale of asset or loss on sale of asset and all such things. Got it? Then let's go to weighted average method. Weighted average method may we add weights. Now usually under simple average method we take 1 lakh plus 1 lakh 20 plus 1 lakh 40 plus 1 lakh 60 divided by 4. 
अंडर वेटेड एवरेज मेथड वी एड वेट वन टू थ्री फोर मल्टीप्लाई विथ वेट फोर्टीन लैक डिड बाई टेन वेटेड प्रॉफिट डिड बाई टोटल वेट दैट सो वी आर वेटेड एवरेज प्रॉफिट so this will give importance to the trend which the profit is following if the profits are simultaneously increasing every year or decreasing every year the trend will be adjusted under weighted average profit method that's weighted average profit then let's go down to see super profit method see profit everyone makes if you make more profit than everyone that is your goodwill so under super profit method goodwill is found as super profit multiplied by number of years purchase not normal profit what is super profit Super profit is profit that you made over and above normal profit. Like everyone makes ten thousand profit, I made twelve thousand profit. So the two thousand what I found extra is my super profit. So under super profit method, goodwill is super profit multiplied by number of years purchase, wherein super profit is determined as actual profit that I made minus normal profit. Twelve thousand that I made minus ten thousand what everybody makes. You get this? Twelve thousand I made is okay. How do you identify ten thousand that everybody makes? that is based on the normal rate of return assuming that i started business with 1 lakh rupees capital every person on the planet can make 10% rate of return so 1 lakh into 10% normal rate everyone makes 10000 but i made 12000 so 12000 is what i made 10000 is what everyone makes difference 2000 is super profit multiply by number of years for which i can do that super profit that is goodwill so goodwill is super profit multiplied by number of years purchase super profit is actual profit minus normal profit and normal profit is found as actual capital employed multiplied by normal rate of return you get this now let's go down to the next one that is capitalization method which is opposite of super profit method under this what we do is profits are equal my profit is 10 my competitors profit is also 10 but my goodwill is what have introduced lesser than what he has introduced as capital i have introduced capital of 80000 and made profit of 10 my friend has contributed 1 lakh rupees to make profit of 10000 so to earn the same profit i have introduced lesser capital i have compensated it by introduction of goodwill that 20000 what i have not contributed but i have earned the same profits as someone who's contributed is my goodwill so goodwill under capitalization method is computed as normal capital what everyone will invest minus actual capital what i have invested everyone will invest 1 lakh rupees to earn 10000 i have invested only 80000 To earn ten thousand rupees, so what everyone invests minus what I've invested is my goodwill. Now the question is, actual capital will be found as six minus the average. How do we find normal capital? To earn a profit of ten thousand, normal rate of return is ten percent. Meaning you should invest. Uh, you should. You are only getting interest at. You are getting returns at ten percent. Meaning to earn ten thousand, one has to invest one lakh. I've invested only eighty. So that difference is my <coughs> goodwill. normal capital is found as actual profit divided by normal rate of return got it guys so this is capitalization method then we have annuity method wherein we take the adjusted average profits or super profit multiplied by annuity factor annuity factor will be given to us in the question let us not get into the zone of computation of annuity factor however in the regular batch i stress on annuity factor teach people how to compute annuity factor also however it's here it's not required you guys can <coughs> relax so this my friends is computation of goodwill i hope you all understood computation of goodwill let me now take you to admission retirement and death of a partner <coughs> shall i and also towards the end of this video i will revise the topic of jlp which you people love the most isn't it guys don't you love it the topic of jlp i know you do hello let's go to admission in the case of partnership firm to increase the scale of operations to increase the capital to increase the managerial people involved in the business they will go for admission of a partner they will admit a, they will admit a new partner whenever they admit a new partner incoming partner is buying his share of profit incoming partner is buying his share in the assets incoming partner is buying his share in the liabilities in the business that's what is the attitude or that's what is a perspective that is very much needed remember in the case of admission the new coming partner will buy his share of profit will buy his share in the total assets will buy his share in the total liabilities from the old partners so when i say buy his share of assets he'll also buy his share in goodwill he has to buy by paying money to the old partners the reason is old partners have worked hard to build that goodwill now the new partner is going to enjoy that goodwill in the future 
yeah we usually think new partner brings in goodwill means he'll bring uh, goodwill to the business business value will go business already has value he is getting himself into that value now he is also participating in that value by contributing money to old partners and buying their goodwill making it his goodwill understood fantastic so what we need to do is he'll get part of profit assets and liabilities have to be revalued because he's buying business no if you have to buy business it needs to be valued so we'll find uh, we'll prepare revaluation account revaluing the profits and losses when we do revaluation of profits or revaluation of assets and liabilities there will be some revaluation profit or loss which needs to be given to old partners in old profit sharing ratio then we'll determine what is the capital how the capital should be in the new uh, after the entry of the new partner so we need to adjust the goodwills that he brings in adjust the capitals and then redraft the balance sheet after the admission got it so first thing is profit sharing ratio previously partners were sharing profits that is old profit sharing ratio once the new partner comes in what they share it in is called as new profit sharing ratio when the new partner comes in old partners have to make some space and accommodate the new partner to that they give up some part of it that is called as sacrifice ratio always remember old profit sharing ratio will be greater than new profit sharing ratio in the case of admission because old partners sacrifice to arrive at new profit sharing ratio remember the formula opsr is greater than npsr opsr minus sacrifice ratio is new profit sharing ratio and the sacrifice of old partners is uh, the share of the new partner done there are several cases on which you need to do problems on this i have simplifiedly put here doing your favorite uh, cartoon show of uh, chota bhim chutki raju you can read that and understand i have given few important uh, pointers also that you need to remember whenever there is an incoming partner if nothing is mentioned then old profit sharing ratio itself is sacrifice ratio they contribute in the same ratio and when incoming partner share is mentioned they can give it in two terms one they can use the word from second one they can use the word or whenever they use the word from directly subtract that fraction from old partner share if they say of then multiply and recipient or result from the multiplicand is deducted you get this so remember from straight minus of multiplication and then minus so that is something that you need to remember if you do example problems you will understand this better so then what we need to do we need to revalue the assets whenever asset value goes up asset value increase it is profit whenever asset value decrease it is loss same with uh, ulta is with regard to liability if liability value increases it is loss if liability value decreases it is like profit got it so if there is any unrecorded asset or unrecorded liability treat it like asset was recorded at zero now its value is increasing or liability was recorded at zero and now its value is increasing that's the easier way to crack this logic and any revaluation profit or loss will be uh, transferred to partners capital account old partners capital account in old profit sharing ratio and uh, remember goodwill though it is an adjust it will be adjusted separately and don't treat it along with revaluation of other assets and liability got it and certain cases may uh, this needs to be done every time when there is reconstitution that is in the case of admission retirement death every case may or when there is change in profit sharing ratio you should always prepare this revaluation account done so revaluation account format is also given up here credit side represents incomes that is increase in the value of the asset or decrease in liability debit side expenses as uh, uh, represents losses that is decrease in asset or increase in liability and it lead to profit credit uh, debit side in revaluation account credit side in partners capital account if it is loss then it is credit in revaluation account and debit in partners capital account sharing them the losses fantastic so then we'll go to memorandum revaluation account certain cases may the organization doesn't want to change the value of assets but needs to share revaluation profits or losses so what do we do we do it like the routine revaluation account account for increase in the asset decrease in the assets increase in liability decrease in liability identify profit share it to partners in old profit sharing ratio but if you do this profit will go to partners but assets and liabilities also will change they don't want to do that in that case we'll do everything ulta whatever was debited here decrease in asset will now be credited here whatever was uh, credited here increase in the value of the asset will be debited so everything will do ulta debit sides will become credit credit side will become debit side and this profit ultimately what was shared to old partners only will now be written off by crediting all the partners 
including the new partner in new profit sharing ratio what happens by this is the incoming partner will share will give the realization profit that needs to be given to old partners without changing the value of assets so the objective of memorandum revaluation account is not to change the value of assets and liabilities continue to record them at book value however the revaluation profit which was entitled to old partners is compensated by the incoming partner you get this so that is the objective of this memorandum revaluation account yeah then goodwill this is a very important part lot of them have a very bad understanding of goodwill everyone thinks that goodwill will increase in admission na 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 goodwill of the firm remains same and it is because of the efforts of the old partners the incoming partner is buying his share of goodwill from the old partners old partners are sacrificing it so the consideration what the new partner brings in towards goodwill should go to old partners because it is their goodwill what is going to become the new partners goodwill anymore their share of goodwill is sold by them to the new partner got it so whenever if he brings his consider if he brings his share of goodwill in cash then we'll write the journal entry cash account debit to goodwill and this goodwill is shared between old partners in sacrifice ratio if he doesn't bring his share of goodwill in cash if he brings it in kind then we'll write asset account debit to goodwill and then such goodwill will be shared to old partners in sacrifice ratio if he doesn't bring his share of goodwill goodwill is to be raised and written off we write the entry goodwill account debit to old partners capital account in old profit sharing ratio we write it off by writing all partners capital account to goodwill account in new profit sharing ratio this will adjust or give credit to old partners for their share of goodwill and it will decrease the new partners capital account done so this is the kind of adjustment in one of the mock test paper questions a very interesting part there was a goodwill adjustment they have asked you to raise goodwill only they have not asked you to write off goodwill this majority of the students will go wrong so please do see mock test paper 2 if i am not wrong wherein there is a question on partnership when i did it in the class i marked it red saying it is an important question and must do before exam so please do see that guys and it will help you prepare well in the examination preparation done so then it can be adjusted through capital accounts will not trade goodwill account at all the new partner should compensate no he will you will reduce his capital account so debit is capital account and uh, it should be given to the continue uh, the sacrificing partners right so their capital accounts will be credited entry will be new partners capital account debit to sacrificing partners capital account this is to be done in the sacrifice ratio that's it so after all of this all you would have to do is uh, there can be question on hidden goodwill so which will be computed based on uh, the new partner's capital new partner share you reverse the new partner share if he is coming for one third share for 1 lakh rupees as capital do 3 and then multiply it with 1 lakh identify the total capital of the firm deduct it from the uh, adjust uh, check it with the total capital including new partner and old partner the difference will be hidden goodwill so the questions can hidden on hidden goodwill also can come see here capitals of a and b are 30000 each B C comes for one third share, bringing fifty thousand capital. If you bring fifty thousand for one third share, total firm capital should be one lakh fifty. But total capital is fifty thousand. He brings thirty thousand A and B. So thirty plus thirty plus fifty. That is one lakh ten. But it should be one lakh fifty. Forty thousand is the hidden goodwill. Yeah. So this kind of adjustments can also come in the question, which you guys need to be little prepared for. And by this, I have completed every single aspect of the topic of admission. you need to know revaluation partners capital with capital adjustment and goodwill adjustment and balance sheet and uh, of all the adjustments that we done in revaluation you need to restate the values in the balance sheet that is prepared after jlp i'll teach you guys at the end after we do the topic of uh, retirement and death got it i'll take another 10 minutes i think it's not an hour yet is it an hour it is just an hour we'll take another 10 minutes and then quickly finish off the topic of retirement and death we will however uh, do the topic of um, what do you say our um, next two chapters that is company accounts and npo in the next video yeah it will be a six part revision in that case got it guys very good retirement of a partner a partner can retire either because of his old age or he fought with other partners or he doesn't want to continue any longer decrease the scale of operations or continuous losses or anything yeah so the perspective is the retiring partner is selling his share in the assets selling his share in liabilities selling his share in profit to the continuing partners that's what we need to remember exactly like admission process mein uh, whatever we did no we need to recompute the profit sharing ratios 
revalue assets and liabilities, arrive at re revaluation profit or loss, share it to old partners, adjust goodwill, adjust capital, adjust balance sheet, adjusted balance sheet after retirement needs to be prepared. Everything else will remain same here except for the case of goodwill adjustment. So I'll quickly run you through. Oh, okay, uh, you just need to know the ratios also. There are three ratios here: old profit sharing ratio, new profit sharing ratio, and gain ratio. Gain ratio is opposite of sacrifice ratio. Yeah. So in the case of retirement, what happens is old profit sharing ratio plus gain ratio will be new profit sharing ratio. So the new ratio will be greater than the old ratio because the continuing partners are gaining. No, the retiring partner share is now their share. Got it? Fantastic. So there are few adjustments on uh, ratios. I have given important points also. When they don't tell anything, OPSR is NPSR, NPSR is gain ratio. However, if they do mention how to compute, if it is equal, not equal, how to compute, I have given an important point. Remember, you guys can read this. That should be able to help you all. Yeah. And revaluation of assets and all is same like how we did. Yeah. Ah, here. Goodwill adjustment, same as previously discussed in admission. Incoming partners buys goodwill from old partners in the case of admission. In the case of retirement, the retiring partner will sell his goodwill or give his goodwill to continuing partners. Continuing partners will take over that goodwill from the retiring partner. Got it? If raised and written off, then first entry is goodwill account debit to old partners. For writing off the entries, new partners or continuing partners to goodwill. So, rest of it is same like how we do in the case of admission. Not much of a difference. You guys can practice few problems on retirement and that will definitely take you guys through. And then I will quickly take you guys through the death of a partner as a topic. Yeah. So whenever a partner dies, it is little similar to retirement, but not exactly retirement because retirement is planned. You will plan the retirement of a partner at the end of the year. Death can't happen like that. So partner will be, you will be there in the partnership form till one date and after that will stop being partner. So what you need to do is the period for which he was in the, he was as a partner in the form till that date, till the date of death. We need to give him his share of share of capital as on the date of death. Interest on capital till the date of death, share of profit till the date of death, any remuneration that is eligible to get till the date of death, his share of goodwill as computed on the date of death, share in the reserves, accumulated profits, share in revaluation profit or loss as on that date, uh, interest on drawings, everything needs to be computed and then given to him. In this, no, everything is similar like share of goodwill can be computed, capital, interest on capital, remuneration, revaluation profit is easy. But interesting part is share of profit. How do we compute share of profit? Usually profit is computed at the end of the year. Here the partner dies in the middle of the year. How do we compute profit if the partner dies at the middle of the year? It is computed on an estimated basis. Yeah, we'll take the previous year or a few previous years profit and then compute uh, arrive at an estimate as to how much profit would have been earned in the period for which the partner was alive. Assuming in the previous year or previous years, 1,20,000 was the profit, annual profit. This year, my partner was alive for 9 months. So, we say 1,20,000 for 12 months. So, for 9 months, what the partner was alive, profit would be 90,000. So, that way we compute expected profit. And on that expected profit, we compute his share and then give it to him. And it will be returned to PL adjustment or PL suspense, which will be adjusted at the end of the year. So, till then, it will remain that way. So, that's an important point that you need to know. Yeah, and uh, one important section that we need to remember before we go ahead is section 37. In the case of death of a partner, we might not be able to immediately settle the deceased partner's share, entire amount that belongs to him. So what do we do? We'll transfer it to executor's account and we need to pay from that. If in case we don't pay that money, this happens even in the case of retirement also, if it is not paid within the time, so for the period, the amount is not settled, the deceased partner's uh, legal lives or the retiring partner will be eligible for share of profit proportion to the amount outstanding or interest at 6% on that amount outstanding, whichever is beneficial to them. I will repeat, to the extent amount is not repaid to the deceased partner or the deceased partner, you will get proportionate share in the profit for such period on that amount outstanding or interest at 6%, whichever is beneficial to such partner or partner's dependents. So that my friends is section 37, what you need to know. Let's quickly discuss JLP and then say Tata Y to this session and we'll discuss NPO and company accounts in the next session. So joint life policy, 
Firstly, remember it is a policy taken on the lives of all the partners by the firm, not by partner individual. It is a policy taken on the life of the partner by the firm. Firm will pay premium. Firm has secured the life of the partner because if in case any of the partner dies and the capital needs to be repaid, firm is under loss. Firm doesn't have enough money to repay the capital. It might force the firm to go for liquidation. The firm will take the policy. Whenever firm takes the policy, firm would have paid the premium. Premium would be treated as expense in penal account debit side. So if the firm receives the policy money, such policy money should not go to that partner because he died. No, no, no. Entire money belongs to firm. Such proceeds should be shared between all the partners in profit sharing ratio. Now the question is how much money will be received by the firm? The money that will be received by the firm from the insurance company is this way. If in case the partner is retiring, if in case the partner is retiring, the firm will receive surrender value. If the firm, in the, if, in, if in case of the firm, the partner dies, then the firm will receive the policy amount. Remember, in the case of retirement of a partner, we receive surrender value. In the case of death of a partner, we, we receive policy amount. Whatever surrender value or policy amount will be received will be shared between all the partners in profit sharing ratio. However, that is the profit part. The debit part cash received will be used to repay the deceased partner share or retiring partner share. Accounting of this JLP can be done two ways. It can be either treated as expense or asset. If JLP premium is treated as expense, then it would have gone to penal account. Entire insurance claim what we receive is shared between partners. However, if JLP is treated as asset, surrender value of JLP will be appearing in balance sheet. So when we receive the amount from the insurance company, it is like sale of an asset. Surrender value 10,000 is there. Policy 1 lakh. You receive 1 lakh. So 1 lakh is the sale consideration received for giving up an asset of 10,000. So we charge 90,000 or we distribute only 90,000 to partners. You get this? However, if there is no surrender value, then no surrender value or no value in balance sheet. Entire amount what you receive, you share. Do you get this? So remember this. JLP can be treated in two ways. JLP can be treated as expense or as asset. If it is treated as expense, Entire premium paid would go to PL. So, entire policy amount or surrender value what we receive will also go to PL and be shared between all the partners in profit sharing ratio. However, if JLP is treated as asset, then surrender value of JLP will be appearing in balance sheet. When we receive JLP money, to the extent it is surrender value, it is to be deducted from the JLP money. Only excess received is like profit on insurance claim, and that excess money only will be shared to all the partners in profit sharing ratio so if you can remember this and also remember the fact that in the case of death of a partner we receive policy amount in the case of uh, retirement of a partner or surrender we receive surrender value we are done with jlp concept this concept is minimum this is this is more than sufficient for you to handle any problem on uh, partnership accounts with jlp however if we discuss in detail i can go on teaching jlp all by itself for next two hours but marathon revision if you know these two pointers more than sufficient Ah, and if in case there is any JLP reserve, treat it like any other reserve distributed to old partners in profit sharing issue. Got it? That's it guys. I hope you all understood the topic of partnership in detail in this quick revision or in this marathon revision. This is the end of part 5 of our CA foundation principles and practice of accounting marathon revision. I initially planned it to be 5. Now uh, considering the fact that we are not able to finish, I will extend it to a 6th session. So we'll have another session coming up very soon, sixth session, wherein we'll discuss the topic of NPO and company accounts. So till then, remember life is not a battle to be struggling. It's a game to be enjoyed. Till the time you guys are learning something, you're having fun. It's all good. The day you guys either stop learning something or stop having fun. Trust me, you might start struggling because you might be in a battle. So the thumb rule to stay happy is pretty simple. It is to stay in the game. So for one last time on this day, I have just one simple question to all of you. Are we in the game? I hope yes we are all in the game that's it guys see you all in the sixth part wherein we'll discuss NPO and company accounts till then tata bye bye take care stay in the game and get lost.